ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Laszlo Bach. Hey, Laszlo. Thanks, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks Thank so you. much. So about, I don't know, six months ago, I read a quote from Laszlo in the New York Times in an interview. Um, I've heard uh, of that paper. Yes, right, in which, it, in which he noted, among other things, that 14% of some of Google's um, teams are uh, made up of people who have never gone to college. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, a, that was a kind of interesting fact. And I, on a whim, I called Google and I said, I'd love to talk to this guy who runs your HR um, uh, named Laszlo Bach. And they were kind enough to set it up. And Laszlo was kind enough to um, give me a lot of time. And I wrote up an, in, an interview. And we get to um, uh, write our own headlines on our columns. And um, so I just said, what the heck, I'll call it how to get a job at Google. I've decided now just to always call my column how to get a job at Google, <laughs> because um, uh, it turned out to be the most uh, widely emailed column I've ever written. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was number one on the New York Times most email list for, for uh, about a week. And, um, uh, and we both got so much feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are things that, that um, uh, Laszlo felt he didn't say that. I went back and wrote another one, and, uh, and it had the same reaction. And it just really one of the things, Laszlo, that inspired me to call this event, how does, you know, how does my kid get a job? Um, it's clearly number one um, uh, question in the world out there. So let's, let's start, for, for people who didn't see the column, and, and, and to update your own thinking, how do you get a job at Google? Mm -hmm. um, what does it take? What is Google looking for? Well, so. Um there's four things we look for in every candidate. Uh, and the four things are, number one, general cognitive ability. So, and it's not just smarts, but it's problem solving and curiosity and ability to learn. Absolute most important thing, because what we believe is you're much better off hiring somebody who can learn than somebody who necessarily actually knows what they're doing. Uh, because if you learn, you can figure it out. If you know what you're doing, you often can't acquire skills that are new quite as easily, and you end up sort of reinventing the same thing again and again. Not universally, not every time, but the main thing we look for is intellectual aptitude and learning ability. Second most important thing we look for is what we call emergent leadership. So when most companies recruit, what they think about is, you know, I want a leader, so I want somebody who was president of the chess club or who was football team captain or who won this or that award or had some formal recognition, was a vice president somewhere, what have you. We don't really care too much about that. When we think about leadership at Google, we instead think about people who are willing to step in when there's a difficult problem, and just as importantly, step out when there's not a need for their expertise. Because we break all our work down into small family-sized groups, sort of teams of four to six people, and different skill sets, diverse backgrounds, and you're not gonna have this, the same person isn't gonna be the right leader for every single thing that we do. So we want somebody who will emerge as a leader and just as importantly, step back. Um, the third thing is cultural fit, and in the tech industry, you know, cultural fit is often sort of a, a veneer for, well, we want people who are just like us. Uh, we actually don't. At, when we talk about cultural fit at Google, what we look for are people who are comfortable with ambiguity, because we're a pretty chaotic, messy environment on the inside. Uh, we look for people who are highly conscientious, because if you have a chaotic environment, you want people who are going to say, you know, oh, look, the, the water bottle needs to be changed because you have a new person coming on stage, and you don't want them drinking somebody else's backwash. Um, you don't want somebody who's just going to go, eh, not my problem. So we, when we think about culture, we think about humility and conscientiousness. Um, and then the last thing is uh, actual expertise. And for the technical roles in the company, which make up about half the company, you actually have to be quite good at engineering. You have to be great at it. For the other roles, though, we take a portfolio approach, where we believe for most of our jobs, we don't actually need you to have deep expertise in what you're going to do. Because again, if you hire people who are able to learn and who are conscientious, They'll take something and figure out how to do it. And what's beautiful is most of the time, when faced with a problem, they'll solve it just as well as anybody else would. But 5 or 10% of the time, they'll come up with something new, something creative, hmm. that you won't get if you have somebody who sort of, you know, to take Abraham Maslow's dictum, sort of, you know, when the only tool you own is a hammer, every problem resembles a nail. If you've looked at the same problem again and again and again and applied the same solution every time, you're going to keep doing that. And we want there to be that spark of creativity. So, Leslie, the, the teams where 14% of the people have no college degree, tell me about that 14%. Mm -hmm. um, where did they acquire their skills? How did they acquire their skills? And what was it they showed when they applied to Google that said to you, you know, we're going to hire you. We don't care if you have no degree. 
Well, so let me first say that the 14% isn't representative, right? Yeah. There's pockets of the company where that's true, there's right. pockets where there's less. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's actually interesting. They acquire the, the skills in all kinds of places, right? Um, you know, Sebastian Thrun was here, I know, earlier talking about Udacity. Some of it is just online training. A lot of it is self-taught. Um, some of it is actually in school. Turns out school works. <laughs> you know, if you can go to college, go to college. It, it helps. Right. Um, but uh, they pick it up all over the place. The harder part for us has actually been figuring out how to find that skill set and assess it. Because when you screen mm. candidates, when you look to hire people, the easy thing to do, and we were guilty of this in our early years, absolutely. And when you're small, it's the right thing to do because you don't need to hire that many people. You look at where someone went to school, you look at what companies you worked for, you look for these markers of qualification. Um, but we ended up actually having to look deeper because our hiring got bigger. We, um, I think the last couple of years we've been the biggest job creator of any company on the Fortune Most Admired list. How many do you hire a year roughly? Um, the company, Tech and non sorry, the, the net hiring each year, net of attrition, uh, is anywhere between, uh, usually it runs about five to 8,000 people a year. Wow. Um, the and how many ones, applications do you get? Uh -huh, we get over two million applications a year. Wow. Um, we actually we were looking at this the other day. Um, and for purpose of comparison, uh, someone from the recruiting team said, if you look at MIT, there's about 11,500 students at MIT, undergraduate, graduate, all the schools. We have that many people apply every day. Wow. Yeah. It's, so a, how, it's a blessing and a curse. How do you manage that? Um, well, the first part is um, we make sure every single person gets looked at by a human being, hmm. which sounds a little, I mean, maybe, you know, that should be the normal standard, but what, what is easy to fall into the trap of is saying everything's an algorithm, we're gonna screen and filter, and if you don't hit these boxes, we're not gonna look at you. We actually have, we, we overinvest in recruiters. Hmm. We have a lot of people, we have superb professionals doing recruiting and screening and assessment of candidates. Um, everyone gets looked at by a human being. Um, and then uh, we have a number of screens. The first thing we screen for, as you'd expect, you sort of get looked at. Um, then we do a phone screen, and the focus on that is if you're an engineer, your technical coding ability, and we don't care how you acquired those yeah. skills, right? We just want to know you can do it. Um, and for everybody, a test of kind of cognitive ability and a little mm -hmm. bit of cultural fit. Um, and then you're off to the races and you come on campus. What about GPA? Uh, GPA is interesting. Um, we, used to, we used to require it of everyone. Um, and it'd be kind of, we'd actually ask for transcripts too. And it was a little embarrassing because certainly as a candidate, you know, um, I remember when I was being interviewed by Google and they said things are looking good and can you send in your, your college transcript? <laughs> and I was, you know, 15 years out of school. I was yeah. like, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the reason we did it was it turns out people lie. Like even knowing you're gonna check the stuff, even though you fill it out, like, you know, about 1% of people would lie so I, I'm 4.0, and then you get the transcript, and they're 2.8. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's just crazy. Or the, everybody you know rounds up, but nobody ever rounds down, right? So uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, rounds up to a 4.0 because it was a 3.51, right? And <laughs> but um, so we so we wasn't, actually wasn't, backed away from that. It wasn't a proxy. It wasn't it wasn't telling you. No, no, no. What we actually found was that um, so it was easy, convenient, and if you're small in recruiting, it kind of makes yeah. sense. Um, what we found, though, was we looked at does it predict performance. We actually did a study internally where we looked at um, 300 different factors, and we mapped them to 25 different performance factors. So we looked at things like um, the performance factors were things like your performance rating, but also your velocity, how quickly do you get promoted, uh, sort of citizenship behaviors, like do you volunteer to interview people, do you organize activities and clubs at Google, are you like an active member of the community? So 25 things like that. We compared them to 300 um, independent variables. Things like, what was your GPA? Where did you go to school? Um, do you own a dog? We thought maybe dog people are friendlier, maybe. <laughs> and what we found was that um, grades are predictive of performance only for your first two years out of school. And after that, they don't matter. So then we said, well, we should stop asking about wow. this entirely. So now if you're a new grad, we ask. Uh -huh. But for everybody else, we don't ask at all. We instead look at what you do. But the trick has been, we then had to train our recruiters and our interviewers to actually do a better job interviewing because, you know, the easy way is to say, well, if they got good grades, they must be a good student. That's also not true because of the way curves work in colleges and you know, there's gentlemen C's at certain institutions and so on. So on that subject, what's the biggest mistake people make in writing a job resume? Mm. Um, uh, wow. Um, well, the trick is writing a resume and interviewing are 
kind of two of the most valuable skills anybody could ever have in their lives. That's where you have the greatest leverage in negotiating with an employer or even transferring jobs internally. It's where you, um, it, it's where you determine whether someone's going to call you back or not, right? But most of us never get any formal training in it. Like it's, hmm. So to answer your question, um, the biggest mistake people do is um, they poorly write what they've accomplished. So most people will say, I led a team or you know, grew sales or something, or you know, I was a member of this or that. Um, the best and correct way to write anything on a resume is to say, I accomplished X as measured by Y by doing Z, right? So not I grew sales by 20%, but I grew sales by 20% on a base of $6 million a year um, by reorganizing the sales force and better targeting customers and doing this kind of segmentation analysis and what have you. And the reason that's so important is because it gives the person reading it a, an understanding of what you've actually accomplished and the thought process behind it and was it hard or easy? Because mm. growing sales by, you, you see this in startups all the time, they say, oh, we grew by 80% this year. Well, you know, if you grew from a million dollars in revenue to a million point eight, that's great, but it's not the same as going from 100 million in revenue right. to 180 million, right? Yeah. And most candidates and applicants don't provide that. What about in the interview? I come in for my interview with Laszlo and I'm, mm. I got my, I bought my red tie. Somebody <laughs> said red ties light up. I button up. And uh, uh, what, what, what's the biggest mistake someone like me makes when I come in for my interview? Well, well you wear a suit. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's, don't my do that. My first journalism teacher, yeah. Hattie Steinberg, said not, you always must wear a tie. Not, not at Google. <laughs> um, I actually, when, when I interviewed at Google, I, I couldn't believe that I wasn't supposed to wear a suit, and the recruiter convinced me. They're like, no, don't wear a suit, don't wear a suit. I actually came in, and I had my tie in my coat pocket the whole time, <laughs> just in case. That's great. Um, so the, um, I think the biggest thing is, and this is true of any interview, but it's particularly true at Google. Um, you go in, you're in a vulnerable position, you're nervous, you want to showcase yourself as best as you can, and you focus a lot on sort of, you know, um, I got to be ready for these questions, I got to be ready for these questions. And what you totally forget are being curious about how this place works. And you know, everyone always says you should prepare three questions. When they say, do you have questions for me, you should try to start sound smart and all this. It's kind of garbage. What you should really do is demonstrate an authentic interest in the place, right? Like if you really want to work at Google, do some homework, right? Like there's got to be something Google does that you love and something you hate, right? I was talking to a colleague, um, this wonderful woman, amazing, amazing personal story and background, um, like overcame all this kind of amazing, difficult like challenge in her life. Um, and she's now actually starting in the fall at Yale uh, to pursue an MBA. Um, but she you know, fought her way to Google and has done a great job. She's going to graduate school. And she said, she was telling me, you know, she hasn't started yet. She said, I've got four job offers. I was like, you're kidding. How is that possible? School doesn't start till August. And the school organizes these social mixers and where you meet with alumni and potential recruiters. And she literally went up to one of these people. Um, and I, I, won't, I won't say which out of... Uh, protecting her privacy, but she basically, it's a consumer products company, they make a product targeted at, at girls, and she said, your product is so awful for girls because it perpetuates these terrible gender stereotypes. Like, how do you, how do you feel about that? And is your real market the kids or the moms who are buying them for the kids? Because if you're a kid, that's not what you want to see. Interesting. And the, this person she was talking to, who's director of marketing for this big global brand, kind of said, um, that's exactly what we're struggling with today. Can, and then they have a conversation and she said, can you come back and interview tomorrow? And suddenly this, this girl who still works for Google has this job offer for a year and a half from now. And, Before business school. <laughs> yeah. And, and so to answer your question, yeah. what she did that was distinctive was she had a position on something and she asked not because she's trying to game the interview. She asked because she, it's an important issue to her. She, had, she wants to know. Hmm. And it turns out that company was also struggling with it. She had no way of knowing if yeah. that would happen. Sure. But that authentic, passionate interest about what you care about that the organization does, that that person does, is huge. And not enough people show that, because they're terrified. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we both got a lot of feedback on was a point you made in, in the second interview, which is that you know, looking at it from an employer's point of view, it's, it's much more valuable for me to know that you, you tried engineering, especially you're going for a tech job. You, you tried to take computer science. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you got a, a C plus in it, mm. um, you didn't give up on that, or physics, or chemistry. Um, just because you're worried about the grade, and take a, a gut course, an, an easy course, and you got an A. Um, and and uh, 
we both got you know readership mail on that um, a lot from English teachers and um, and, and others who said you dropped computer science for English. You know. um, but how do you think about that? What what, what, you, what was the point you were trying to make? Yeah. So I think it's worth you know laying out. Yeah. So so thanks. Um, you know I, I mean I have a liberal arts education. Went to a liberal arts college. I think it's critical, important. It, it's important as a nation. It's important because of the breadth you get. And I think what you discover later in your career is having breadth actually allows you to see connections that people who just have depth don't see, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I see them in particular, but what I've seen observing other people, right? The, the more you know about more things, the more interesting connections you can make, right? Um, again, not, not to pick on Sebastian, right? But you know, he's a computer scientist. Like, what's he doing designing an online university? But <laughs> because he can bring different fields together, yeah. it's pretty cool. Um, so my point was more that um, people shy away from pain Right? And, and math and hard science classes like biology and physics and chemistry, they're graded typically on a straight curve. The entry level ones in computer science, for example, are treated as weeder courses. So there's all this pain associated with going through it, right? And you're a finite number, only 10% of people are going to get A's. Whereas in most other classes, it's much more general. And if you clear some bar, you're going to get an A, right? Which is why you have schools where, you know, there's <coughs> East Coast schools where the median GPA is like a 3.5, right? Yeah. Everyone gets an A. Um, and the things you learn by taking these more quantitative classes where you actually experience this pain of like the grades are tough, the professor's not as friendly, you know, I'm not going to get straight A's, are incredibly valuable the rest of your life because you learn, first of all, analytical skills, which are really valuable. And it'd be great if more people study computer science. I think that's important. But most people in America don't understand compound interest, right? Like they say, which should I pay off, my credit card or my student loan? Well, I'll pay off whichever payment is higher, not realizing that, you know, you should pay off the higher interest one first because that's costing you more money. That's what you need to learn. You, you develop this resilience, this grit, because you sort of like face a clear objective standard. You meet it or you don't, and then you try to overcome it again. And in the real world, once you graduate, that's, that's kind of life, right? Like the people who are successful are the ones who do meet failure and learn from it and, and persist. So that was the point. And taking the other classes are incredibly important, but I think it's an error for people to shy away from these more challenging, not more challenging, but uh, more, more structured in their assessment and more objective areas because it's hard or it doesn't seem as much fun because those skills repay you over your lifetime tremendously. Google did something unusual. You did an audit on minority hiring and mm -hmm. shared it with the public and um, showed that in terms of um, African American uh, participation in the Google workforce, particularly on the technology side, was you know, infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what's been the company's takeaway from that? Uh, well, we've, you know. What was the result? The, or, the or, result, the result. Um, so yeah, we, we chose um, a few weeks ago to make public our diversity statistics. And uh, we actually made that decision a couple years ago. Um, but we wanted to actually make sure the data was correct uh, because uh, the way you're required to report to the government every year and the way they ask you to report is they say, well, if employees don't self-identify, please make a guess. So literally what companies do in the United States is they look up the employee databases and look at your picture. Go, nah. You know, <laughs> Laszlo like... ends in an O, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's what we were having to do. So we wanted to get that right. And then we also wanted to be able to actually show that we could improve on it. And we've done some really fun, cool, powerful things over the last year and a half. Um, but then we decided the right thing to do, too, was to put ourselves out there and say, like, look, despite our best efforts, even with this brand that we have behind us and all these clever people, um, they're just, we're not where we want to be in terms of representation of blacks and Hispanics in the company, and particularly in computer science, and in terms of women in computer science. And um, what we've been doing since then is a tremendous amount of work um, in partnership with um, a, very, a wide range of organizations with uh, HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. One great example is um, we actually had a Googler. We didn't have him. He chose to. We have this engineer named Charles Pratt. Brilliant guy, wonderful guy, a couple years out of school. And he decided to go hang out at Howard University for a semester and help them design a course on computer science. And they had one. But the challenge is the people who end up coming into Howard and studying computer science you know, are coming fairly new to computer science compared to somebody who goes to MIT who probably had dad, and you know, the stereotype is it's dad, sit him down at age 10 and start teaching him about engineering. And so you have a very different level of preparation. So Charles went and spent, uh, spent a year, actually, with Howard, working with uh, the faculty there. And we went basically from having zero interns from Howard in computer science to having 11 this summer, which we're mm. delighted with. 
So we've been doing more targeted outreach, and the early signs are good, but we can't do it alone. There's a big pipeline problem, and um, you know we're nowhere near where we ought to be. So before we go to questions, we're going to move the mics out. People have questions for Laszlo. I want to ask one about while we're on the subject of college campuses. Um, and it's, it's something you spoke about, I think it's really important, with the cost of college education mm. going up now. You know, whether it's community college and it's 10,000 for four years, or you know, Ivy Leagues and it's at 250,000. Um, what, what is your advice for parents and young people for when they think about their college choice? Mm. What to keep in mind, especially in an age where a company like Google may have 14% of some teams with no, people with no college degrees. Mm -hmm. That kind of intentionality. What was, what's your, your advice? Well, I, I think, first of all, it's, it's a heavy trip to put it on an 18-year-old, right? Like, uh, we've so we'll all talk to their parents. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to kind of figure all this stuff out and be like long-term in your perspective on it, but a couple things. One is, um, if you can, think about the signaling effect of what you do, right? For most employers of any size, when they get a resume, they look for the signals. Are there companies I recognize? Are there brands I recognize? Have they done things that I can relate to that sound impressive? Mm -hmm. Going to a fancy school? is a signal. So if you, can, if you can go to a school that's widely known and well known, absolutely do it, study whatever you want, you're gonna live happily ever after, mm -hmm. almost certainly. Um, for everybody else, right, who doesn't have that opportunity, um, think about the signal it's gonna send and think about what you're gonna get out of it because you're gonna be writing a really big check to get that education. And all the data says a college education helps. You have higher lifetime earnings. But there was a piece on the radio yesterday, uh, Michael Roth, the president of Wesleyan University, um, has a book out talking about this, and uh, a caller called in and said, you know, I'm a liberal arts grad, uh, you know, I work at a coffee shop in Seattle, uh, all my friends are, who work there also are, you know, college grads were really struggling. So they don't have a clear signal that they can send to employers, and my own personal perspective is the most relatable, understandable thing for employers is basically to say, like, look, I can do math, I can solve problems, right? So if you're going to study anything, Study some computer science, study physics, study chemistry, study math, because the skill set you will get from that actually is translatable in any environment. You know, if you work for an ad agency, there's math involved in figuring out customer accounts, right? If you work in, in a restaurant, you know, mm -hmm. there's math involved in running that place. Like, it's, it's a fundamental lingua franca, mm -hmm. and I would say wherever you go, think about the signals, think about the cost and the benefit you're going to get. And you know, take some quantitative classes. Mm. And when you write your resume, highlight those and do as well as you can in those. And that will help. Terrific. Well, we've got time. We've got long lines here. So we'll start over here. Please, and, and if you'd identify yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Don Asher, and I write books for students about how to find jobs. And uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> my book of interest is How to Get Any Job, Life Launch, and Relaunch for Everyone Under 30, or How to Avoid Living in Your Parents' Basement. <laughs> So uh, my question is really about society, and it's really for both of you. Uh, my experience of employers at this time, major corporations, is that they're fighting over the top 4% of uh, graduates, and they'll hire another 10% after that. But they really couldn't care less about the other 86%. Hmm. So my question to you is a societal question. What are we going to do with the state? These are college grads. They're already elite because they graduated from college. What are we going to do with all these people? And, I've, and I mean now. I don't mean in some idolized future. Thank you. I think he addressed it to you. No, no it's definitely to you. <laughs> um, um, well, I actually think it's a bigger problem than you outlined. Um, because in the US, only a third of people actually graduate college. right? A third have some, and a third never go. So you have this tremendous workforce, potentially. And even if you think globally, there's, there's absolutely no reason to think that talent and intelligence you know, is hoarded by the people who happen to go to college or certain colleges, right? Like the big challenge is there's amazing, capable people everywhere in all kinds of backgrounds. Um, I got this great letter from a guy from the Philippines who didn't go to college, so his brothers could. And, you know, he has this amazing story and he ends up getting a job as like a data entry guy. And, you know, 12 years later, he's, you know, head of facilities for a business process management company in the Philippines and he's proud. But he wrote that he felt the sting every time that he didn't go to the right schools, he didn't go to school, he was shut out, right? Um, I think, I think the short-term answer um, is employers need to be more open-minded about what they look for, and they need to get better at assessing people. The problem is, we as human beings, we all think we're good at assessment, right? We all think we're great at interviewing people, right? Like everyone I've interviewed, of course, I can, I can peer into their soul, and I know, and I understand mm -hmm. them. And the reality is, by definition, we're all average, right? Um, and so 
I think the important thing that needs to happen is that employers need to actually understand that the traditional way of interviewing and assessing and screening, all that gets you is more people like you. And that doesn't serve the, you know, setting aside your, your population of college grads, the two-thirds of people who are just as smart and capable and can do just as much good. And I think that needs to change. Over here, we ask for quick questions, and then we can get as many people as we can. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Christopher Chain. I'm a school board member for the Mountain View Wisman School District, the K-8 district in Mountain View, where um, half our students are at-risk minorities, very similar to many traditional Silicon Valley school districts. So my question is, how should us, our traditional school districts, change so that our students may one day be future Google employees? Um, put, this is, I don't, I don't mean to beat the drum, and I'll give a short answer, but, um, I think the, a few things. One is push them to take the hardest classes and the quantitative classes because that will differentiate them from everyone else in the marketplace. Number two, um, have the teachers compare notes. You know, um, I, I went to public schools and one of the things I observed, I remember in eighth grade, comparing, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, comparing notes with juniors and sophomores talking about junior high school teachers. And we said, yeah, it was exactly the same when I went through it six years ago as two years ago. So those particular teachers were doing the same thing again and again rather than comparing notes. And many great teachers do, but I think there's a huge opportunity for local innovation. Um, the third thing is, one of the things we're doing at Google is we, uh, we made a $5 million grant uh, through Donors Choose to the College Board. Um, and the reason was we, we want to fund AP quant classes, maths, physics, chemistry, anywhere, and the, the, the string attached to it is that the enrollment in those classes has to mirror the demography of your school, right? Because most of those classes, AP classes, tend to be concentrated in affluent white or affluent Asian communities, and that's great. They should all take those classes, but the, we want to tap all the other talented people. That's great. I'm going to ask the last three questioners, just each ask your question, and the last okay. I'll have you sure. uh, sum sure. it up. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Jones Johnson, and I'm here from UMass Medical School in Massachusetts. Um, I lead a team of talent acquisition professionals, and so we've always, we always hear about how wonderful Google is and all your best practices. I'm wondering um, now, are, what are you thinking about in terms of the future? Are there things around your, your approach that you think you might want to change from a talent acquisition perspective to position your company uh, moving forward? Great. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Over here. Go ahead. I'm Glenn Fukushima with Center for American Progress. A few years ago when um, uh, Craig Barrett was CEO of uh, Intel, he was on a Charlie Rose program. And after talking about all the success of Intel and his own professional success, Charlie Rose asked him, what really keeps you up at night? And he said, the question is whether my granddaughter will be able to get a good job in the United States. So. With regard to your point about wanting diversity, I assume that you're open to people from around the world to apply to Google. But is, is the concern that Charlie Rose stated, or rather that uh, Craig Barrett stated to Charlie Rose, something that concerns you or Google? I mean, do you make a distinction between uh, Americans versus non-Americans in terms of your hiring? Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you. And our last one. And sort of bookending that question, yeah. this is, uh, I'm Brian McElroy. I work at uh, Telco Orange Giant Evil Company. Um, Honestly, Laszlo, do, does ageism exist in the Valley and at Google in particular? And what are you doing about that? Um, so not the segment that's fresh out of school, the ones that are, have other interests perhaps than just spending all night at Google. Yeah. Yeah. Proof again, Laszlo, that the last question is always the one that gets you. Yeah, OK. So um, short answers. Talent acquisition, um, I think the coolest thing, the two coolest things we're doing, um, most interesting and hardest, one is we're finding um, you know, the sort of easy to find people are found and uh, the best people aren't always looking around and so we're building longer, deeper relationships and cultivating people over time. That's particularly true at places like the historically black colleges and universities where having like a relationship matters. You can't just show up and say, hey, we want to hire you. Like you, you actually have to build a relationship. Um, there's some very, very neat stuff we're going to do in that regard uh, in the next year or so. Um, the other piece related to that is, and it relates to how you look at resumes and so on, is we're much doing broader work on making the unconscious conscious because we human beings make bad decisions all the time, right? Like the, you know, there's priming bias, there's anchoring bias, there's halo and horns effect, um, and all this shows up in when you do recruitment and you end up like recruiting a certain type and we're trying to and working to and have sort of retrained folks to see past that. Um, in terms of the jobs, the, I think my answer is, um, 
We don't have a US versus non-US bias in terms of hiring people. We, we're fortunate we have offices all over the world. So you know, we've, we're in you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of countries, so we hire people wherever the best talent is. Uh, what we do see is that the most talented people on the planet often do want to come to the United States. Uh, if you look at PhD degrees granted in computer science, half of them go to non-US residents and citizens, and they take all that expertise, and then they move back home which is sort of great for the world, but my friend John Doerr often says we should staple a green card to every advanced degree we give in a quantitative field um, because people want to come here to learn and we should, we should give them jobs. Um, and the last question about ageism. Um, first of all, I'll say I, I believe today our oldest Googler is 83 years old. Um, so we've, we've got a span. Um, we actually look inside the company quite a bit for evidence of discrimination. Um, we look by race, we look by gender, we look by age, uh, we look by job level. Uh, you know, some managers like to sort of, you know, take a little, you know, take $10 away from every junior employee so they can give the senior people more money, and it's hard to pick that up, like when you're doing bonus pools and things. Um, we have not seen any systemic evidence of it, um, and one of the things I alluded to is uh, last year we put 23,000 of our employees through this unconscious bias training program that we developed um, to sensitize people to the small slights and things that, um, that cause an environment to be unfriendly uh, and that cause people who are of different ages to sort of feel you know, uncomfortable or unhappy. Um, so a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think we're far from perfect, um, but we, we continue looking at it very closely. Leslie, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Really, really appreciate it.